I'm Josie Duffy Rice. I'm president of The Appeal. We're a news outlet that produces original journalism about the criminal justice system. I'm also an Eric and Wendy Schmidt fellow at New America and co-host of the Justice in America podcast. I'm very honored to be here um, and to be joining you all for another social distancing social from Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership um, of Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. Today, we're talking about how uh, COVID-19 is threatening prison health systems. And I'm joined by Lawrence Bartley, the director of News Inside with the Marshall Project. Hi, Lawrence. Hi, Josie, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. So let's start with just um, telling the audience a little bit about what we're seeing and hearing about what's happening in prisons right now um, across the nation with this virus. What are you um, hearing about in terms of how prisons are being hit, jails are being hit, and what's the current situation if you had to kind of, I mean, there are thousands of correctional facilities, so you can't just, you know, draw too, you know, too broad of a brush across all of them, but what are we in general seeing, especially in places like New York City, Boston, um, Washington State, places that have been particularly hit hard? Well, in, in general, um, by the way prisons are designed, it's, it's virtually impossible to social distance. You know, cells are like you see on TV, these long hallways with mm -hmm. when the doors are made of bars and people are right next to each other. So as you can imagine, if someone was to cough, then that cough mist will go in the air and it can go in the cell next to the person, the cell on top or, or below. Um, mm -hmm. Also, there are these dorm areas where people sleep in dorms with cots that are just three feet apart and, and there's no way to social distance at all. So as you, one would imagine that the, the virus is, is, is passing along pretty rapidly inside of um, correctional facilities. But what we've been noticing lately is that, um, which is no surprise to people who are, are incarcerated, that they are the very last people to get tested or, or for um, any officials to pay close attention to. Because of that, you will see different pockets of states who are testing entire facilities, but but you don't see like uh, the entire country testing their, their entire prison population. So we just don't know how many people have been have been affected by the, the coronavirus. Last count, we just studied that, we done it at Marshall Project. We found that 9,437 people has tested positive for the coronavirus. And that number is rising. The trend is going up just as on the outside, the curve is being flattened, but that number doesn't scratch the surface of how many people have been affected because people just simply aren't being tested. Yeah, you know, I think um, I, like at Rikers, right, in New York City, which has obviously been hit the hardest in terms of cities nationwide, we're seeing a rate 10 times that of outside um, of people in Rikers who actually have been, contracted the virus. Um, and so what we know, right, and what I think people don't actually think about a lot when it comes to prisons and correctional facilities is how much um, how much mobility there is in the sense that like people are all constantly being released, right, from these facilities, especially jails. Um, people who work there go home to their families. Their families go to work. Um, we are talking about we're not talking about just people being infected in the facility, right? When you allow for a virus to run rampant in such a small space, and those people are, you know, those people aren't all staying in that small space, then we're also contributing to the illness outside of, of a jail or prison. Exactly. I mean, that's a, that's a point that I've been bringing up for about two or three weeks now that there can be a staff member who, who contracted the virus and they could, that person could be handing out the mail to give it to someone who's incarcerated. An incarcerated person could go in the mess hall and pass it to numerous people throughout the facility. And that those people can pass it to correction officers in a whole nother part of the jail. Mm -hmm. And that correction officer can bring it home to his family member or the family member go to work and pass it on to other people. So whereas we're flattening the curve out here, in, in a few months, we can see another spike and future okay. waves start to occur 
because we didn't pay attention to what was happening in the correctional facilities, a place where, as I mentioned, they can't social distance, they can't wear masks because it's against the rules, they mm -hmm. don't have um, gloves, um, they're just starting to give out cleaning supplies like, um, like bleach, watered down bleach and Perel, but that's not everywhere. A lot of places don't have Perel. They can't clean themselves or stay safe. So that's a very good point you raised. Yeah, let's talk about supplies briefly because I, you know, there's a lot of talk about making sure you're washing your hands, making sure you're sanitizing, making sure you're wearing a mask. You know, we have this very few things that someone could do in a situation where they're trapped with lots of people to maybe stave off an infection. And in prison, that's basically impossible. Um, you made the point about um, watered down bleach and Purell, but I think, would you say that basically what you're seeing is just a complete unavailability of supplies? I would say that, you know, some supply, like for instance, New York State, they're, they're, um, their officials, they're trying to issue supplies, but they, it's a chain of command. It has to, a superintendent just can't say, I'm gonna give everyone bleach, I'm gonna give everyone masks. They have to get approval from Albany, even Albany has to get approval from the government, but they're trying to trickle down, they try to do something. So they're passing out watered down bleach inside New York State Correctional Facilities. But then they got different places like Mississippi and Arkansas and, and these different places where it's different there. And, and sometimes they don't have access to supplies or even soap for that matter. One guy in Mississippi reached out to me and said that he has to share a sink with 60 people in his dorm. They have to share 10 sinks between 60 people and they have soap there and the sinks are dirty and they have to share like, like, like it's, it's crumbles of soap, little, it's not just a soap bar, it's, it's crumbled pieces of it that they all have to share. So it, it's, it's really tough for these people to keep themselves safe. And then I think the other thing that we know, right, is that sometimes you only can get soap if you have enough money to get soap, if you can afford it from the commissary. And, you know, that's a class, that, that has its own sort of um, economic implications, right? It also has implications about who has family they can rely on to actually give them commissary money, who has resources like that. And I think some of the stories we're hearing at the appeal, right, people are trading, you know, their packets of food for soap or their packets of food for a face mask. And, you know, much of prison is an underground economy just because we don't provide people in these facilities with the resources that they need in order to have what they need ever. Mm -hmm. But I think, especially in a moment like this, you know, my personal opinion <laughs> um, is that it's, it's neglect, right? I mean, it's like, it is, not only asking for these people to get sick to force them to pay for soap, but it's asking for the people who work there to get sick. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing left and right that correctional officers are dying from coronavirus right now because they, we haven't you know, prioritized their health as well as the people in prison who are also, many of them are also dying. Yes, and, and correctional officers are forced to conduct strip searches. Right. And to touch be very intimate, right. search, search cells at right. a time like this, and their lives are at risk. And, and you know, I'm, I'm talking about the incarcerated people, but correctional officers feel it too, and they're people too, and, mm -hmm. and they're being ignored. They're being forced to do things that are putting everyone at risk, and it's sad to do. And um, I'm glad you brought up the point about um, how economically it can be tough for someone incarcerated. Unfortunately, I was incarcerated. I went to prison when I was 17 years old, and I did 27 years in two months. And on, on the inside, I know that my prison job, at the least, at least a person can make in a, in a New York State prison is 10 cents an hour. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I mean, I was one of the fortunate ones. I was making $20 every two weeks. Right. Fortunate. So I had to ration that money between food, uh, um, soap, you know, toiletries and, you know, whatever I needed to sustain myself for two weeks because going in a mess hall wasn't an option. It was food. Right. So, right. so imagine those people who the state provides one bar of state soap every week mm -hmm. to those people. How can they wash their hands every time they go in and out of their cell, every time they touch cardboard or metal surface? That, or, or plastic surface where the virus could live on for a substantial period of time. 
So it, it's very tough in those situations and it kind of fuels that underground economy. Yeah. And then just, just thinking that those who don't have the means, don't have the hustle or don't have the ability to barter something, they can lose their life just because of that. And you know, it's, it's, it really, a lot of the narrative around this virus, right, is we have to help each other. We have to support each other. We're all in this together, et cetera. But what are we, what, what does it mean when, if you have a bar of soap, 59 other people, you know, in your general area don't? Like, it doesn't, you can't save yourself then, and you can't really save other people. And what we're, what we're once again doing, I mean, is saying to the world not only that incarcerated people don't matter but that we're not even gonna give them the tools to be able to protect their own health the way that you know we're, we're punishing them in, in such a different such a more extreme way than i think most people think about um incarceration right definitely you are right and um unfortunately it's sad and uh but i i hope that that you know, we we all hope that this this virus wasn't here, that we don't have to be in this situation. Right. But there are lessons to learn from this situation, and like you mentioned, that we're all in this together. Once we all, well, I think we all already figured it out that a virus can pass, like from people incarcerated to people on the outside. But mm -hmm. acting on it, figuring out and acting on it is is two different things. But once once what we know to be true come in line coming to alignment with, with how you know state officials are, are acting on it and the government is acting on it to trickle down to the the, the person that is sitting in this cell inside of a correctional facility with only 10 making only 10 cents an hour sweeping and mopping the floor and we do things to help that individual which in turn will help everybody else stay healthy then we then we we effectively turn the corner in the right direction so i'm hoping that we see something like that occur so mm -hmm. after this is all over, then we could start looking at punishment differently and right. the way people are treated differently going forward. So let's talk about solutions, quote unquote, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the back end solutions is medical care, right? Healthcare, providing, you know, if you're not going to do anything to prevent people from getting a virus in, in a correctional facility, are you going to be able to treat them? And that's something I don't actually think that we talk, you know, that the world talks enough about or, or the political structures talk enough about, which is how poor the healthcare system is in correctional facilities. I mean, how just, the, I mean, even, I mean, there are some really, really incredible doctors who work in this, this system. So it's not to say that each individual in it is is poor but they're not given the supplies the time and and the resources that they need to be able to provide health care to those who are struggling the most right um I, i've heard from many people who are incarcerated and they have their theories on what go on and mm -hmm. one man telling me that uh that health care systems inside of prisons there are they are the reason why these entities are be able to provide services is because they bid on contracts in order to do so. Right. And these contracts they bid on, they might say, if if I say they bid it against another another uh, service provider, and service provider A says, I can give you ten services mm -hmm. at this price, but right. service provider B says, I can give you fifteen services at this price. The, the state that the bill would be, right? So when, it, when they do that, it kind of dilutes um, the, the service that they give everyday person. Like when a person goes in with, with chest pains, they might say, all right, take this, this, this aspirin for your, for your chest pains or medicine D that they give for everything. They have a, a person who's been incarcerated for a long time, they know that it's just one medication that they give for almost everything. Thing, so right. it's like, yo, so, Imagine you pay for that, right? I right. Mean, so some yeah. some states make you pay for it, but other right. people, they, so I've seen bills that they want to do copay for people who are poor for the begin with to go to prison, and their families are impoverished. So it's like it's like crazy. But right. even if it isn't any copay, it's just real tough on people. So imagine you just ex exacerbate an already stressed healthcare system. Mm -hmm. It might be some great doctors that you mentioned, 
but they have limited resources and they have to follow the culture of how they handle their incarcerated patients in order to maintain their jobs. And then it's exacerbated by this COVID-19 crisis, then you have a lot of bodies piling up as a result. Yep, I think that's, I mean, what you hear about the expect, this sort of um, expectations of people in the medical industry, in correctional facilities, it's, you know, how much can we get for how little money, which is not, you know, it's funny in an era where it's like, you can keep your health care if you, if you want to, right? Like what we know is that um, in correctional facilities, you have no choice about who provides you medical care, what they provide, and whether they're willing to listen to you. And we keep hearing stories at the appeal of people saying, well, I went in and I said, there was one out of Louisiana of a man who said, I think I have coronavirus. And Louisiana prisons are being hit horribly right now, just really, really rough. Yes. If I have coronavirus, I think I have COVID-19. And he got, first of all, beaten by like sheriff's deputies in jail for, for asking for help. And then once you get help, if they say, we're not going to treat you for this, you don't have any recourse. You don't have any option, right? Um. And so what we're, I mean, I, and all the other thing we're seeing left and right is that like, it's not as if there are a lot of doctors, right? There's usually one, maybe two. And if they get sick, what, what do we do? Right. And so every sort of social ill that kind of is encompassed in these, in the, in the criminal justice system more generally, but I also think in sort of the American social fabric, right, is so exacerbated in prisons and, um, and we're seeing what happens now when you have a system that doesn't take care of people's basic human needs um, and something like this virus hits. Yeah, that, that, that's really something. And um, I remember like, as you were speaking, I'm just thinking of so many different scenarios. Like what if the doctor you mentioned gets sick and it's not there? Then right. what the facility has to do is they, they, they usually have a contract with the, the closest medical facility next to them. Mm -hmm. So they put you in an ambulance and try to send you there. We wrote a story on uh, incarcerated or uh, coming to a, with COVID-19, coming to a ICU near you. Mm -hmm. So you send an incarcerated person to a, a local hospital area to be treated, but then there's people in the hospital, people in the community that don't want you there. Right. We don't want this incarcerated person there. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand the logic. Some people who are incarcerated did some horrible things. But I also know that I've been there for, for many years, for like 20, over 20 years. And there's some people that I know that, that I've spent more time with than I spent with my own parents. Mm -hmm. and, and they became like family members to me. And some of those people have done a 180 from what they were. Some of them were into drugs and they did some horrible things and they just so embarrassed by the things that they've done. And, and when, when they see on the news on um, parolees or vilified, they, they're just so hurt because that's not who they see themselves as being. Right. You know, 95% of those people are getting out and they just want to be, they want to live and some parts of them want to be accepted. But when they don't even have a chance to, to start from go, like go being being released because uh, um, the community or, or, or government or, or people at large um, don't feel that they should be treated for COVID-19 because it's because they are less worthy or because it's taking away resources from someone else. Whatever the reasons are, it results in the death of somebody who's mm -hmm. like, man, I just want a chance to redeem myself. And what we're doing is we're sentencing people to death right? Just by function of them being in prison right now. I mean, we, you know, you meet a lot of people who say, okay, I don't believe in the death penalty, but I do believe in, you know, people going away, which is, I mean, negative. I, I understand that, but, you know, what we're doing is sentencing people to death. And you can, you know, you can assume that if a prison is, or a jail is actually transporting someone to the hospital, they're in rough shape right? They're not transporting you to the hospital for a cold. They're not transporting you in the hospital until you're in really, really bad shape because we don't prioritize those people. So we know that this fear of, well, we're, they're going to come into the ICU and they're going to, they're dangerous. They're not dangerous in a moment of being, you know, you know, trying to 
hope that they live through a virus any more than anybody else is dangerous in the moment where they're hoping they live through a virus. But right. you know, you made you you brought something up about ninety five percent of people getting out, and it reminds me that um, a lot of people in prison are really elderly. We have we have spent thirty years sentencing people to these excessively long sentences, and what does that mean now? It means we have people in prison, tons and t thousands and thousands and thousands of people in prison, who you know have been in prison for 30 years. I think you were, you, you served 27 years, right? Yes. You know, we're talking about 50s, 60s, 70s, 70 year old people um, who are sitting in prison cells right now. And we know that's at, who's at most risk of the virus. I, I thought you, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the elderly populations in prison, because I don't think that's how most people picture prisons, right? And whenever um, I go, I take someone to a correctional facility for the first time. That's, I feel like that's the first thing I always say is I didn't realize there were so many old people in, yeah. in, in prison. There are, there are a lot of old people. Um, when you, when you talk about elderly, it reminds me of this, this guy named Cote that I know. He mm -hmm. was, he was old, he'd been in prison for a very long time, over 30 or maybe 40 years. Um, he had gotten so bad that he had a cane. He used to walk very fragile. And, you know, people in prison, they got this thing of like, out here, they give you a dap. And um, I don't know if people realize that, you know, the, the you, you see the fist bump, the fist bump started in prison. Mm -hmm. The fist bump started because usually if you shake someone's hand, an official think that you're passing something. Mm -hmm. So if you reach your friend, people started giving fist bumps instead. So it was this old man named Cote on, on, on the cane. I saw him in the hallway and I wanted to give him a fist bump, but I had to go down to like where his hand was holding the cane to kind of bump his fist. And I almost knocked him over because he was so frail. And, and, I, I, and I remember feeling just so messed up that I almost did that to him. And, and to know that there's so many other people like that who right. are frail and they might be, they, because they, they're at the end of their life, they, they experience the body starts to break down in so many different ways. And then for, for COVID-19 to hit, those people basically don't have a chance. Even right. the medical prison facilities that they go to, you're still piled on top of each other. We just did a story about one in California, about Abby Van Sickle, she, she penned a story about it with a lot of different photos. It's just horrible, a horrible looking, cluttered situation and it's tough and you know the thing is i think what makes it especially just unjust to me is the fact that these are people who their chances of um committing another i mean crime at all much less a serious crime what we would consider to be a serious crime is close to nil i mean what we know about um crime and people's likelihood of committing, I mean, what we would consider a violent crime, right, is that the older they get, the less likely it is. And we know what, what it means when someone who is 17 does something. It doesn't mean that they're going to do it at 27, 37, 47, and especially right. not 57 and 67 and 77. I mean, you let these people out of prison, right, to save their lives, and you're not putting other lives at risk. But that's actually not a calculation most people are willing to make. Right, right. I mean, people age out. Right. But, uh, unfortunately, um, it's been, you, you see people being released from jails, but you don't see a lot of people being released from prison in this era. You know, there's, there's, uh, and, and I heard governors say they're going to start letting people out, well, 55 years and older, you know, right. but a lot of people haven't got out. We're here to talk about it, but if you do the research, a lot of people haven't got out, but you have right. countries like Iran that let out 85,000 prisoners. Right. Know? So right. I'm just reminding people to please submit questions if you want. We'll start asking them in just a second if we um, get any in. Um, you can do it at the Q&A button at the bottom. But I, I wanted to talk about mass release because um, it's traditionally been the third rail, I think, in political decisions. And I think even in a moment like this, where what we know is if you don't let people out, they're going to get sick. If people get sick, many of them are going to die. In part because we have not, we have not 
allowed people in prison to take care of themselves, provide, you know, quality health care to make sure that they're healthy to be able to survive a virus like this. Mm -hmm. um, are we, I know that we're hearing talk about people say, well, we're going to let people out and they're, you know, some people are doing that. Would you say that that's something you're seeing widespread? Um, I hear talk widespread, but I don't see a lot of people getting out. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, the BOP, the um, Bureau of Prisons, which is the federal prison system, they say they're going to let a lot of people out. But when we look, we did a little research into the numbers, they haven't let a lot of people out because of this. And um, I hear all the time now people saying, well, if you let them out, there's not any resources out here where they're going to go. People need right. shelters. And to the person on the inside that's trying to get out, and they finally talk about letting out. Then they want another excuse. Oh, so your shelter's no resources for you. The person's like, man, just let me out of here. Right. right. I have a better chance fearing out there where there's more space. I could go to the store to buy Purell, Clorox, sanitary wipes, gloves, a mask. I can do that. Well, I can't do that in prison. So let the person out in order to let that person save his or her life. And um, and in the country as a whole, the the crime rate has been going down. There's a lot of fear that you let people out, they're gonna commit more crimes, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we don't know that, but it'd be interesting to see what happens. If they let people out and, and, and the crime rate doesn't spike, then, then what happens? Does that mean we had this mass incarceration thing all wrong? Right. But, uh, what's gonna play out in the next couple of months is gonna be super interesting for numerous reasons. And look, I think, I mean, I, I, someone actually asked the question, if prisoners at that age get out, how can they survive? They may not have housing, much less a job, and can they get support from the Pandemic Relief Fund? I think, you know, these are important questions. How do we provide for people who have been in prison 30, 40, 50 years? And in my experience, my clients who um, have been, like, for example, up for parole, like that has been their biggest obstacle right is like parole board saying okay well we don't think you're a risk but what are you going to do now you've been in prison forever right um but what we know i think is what you're saying a that they might not have resources i mean there are resources in a lot of places for people who are returning from prison so um depending on where you are what you have they, but let's even assume worst case scenario right they may not have resources it's better than being in you know in the middle of what is basically sure to be a fire starter situation right. right and but to answer the question about pandemic relief fund no we've the, the 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 federal pandemic relief fund has pretty much excluded anybody who's formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated from getting those resources and it's another way that we see us um we see the 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 government more generally um but especially this federal government in particular isolating formerly incarcerated people from opportunity. Yes, once again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, another question we're getting is about programming in prison, um, particularly educational and work training programs, and it's largely ceased. So what's the effect of that? And what should facilities be doing to programming right now? Huh. The effect of that is tough. Uh, like I said, I hear from a lot of people who are incarcerated and and you know, we've been sheltering in place for what, six, six weeks now? And the same thing inside of, of prisons. People have been, they've they already been isolated, but now they're further isolated. You know, programs are closed. Um, some states you could just go to gym and yard and, and it's very little lim limited. Picture the yard being just a big outside parking lot with no cars and you're just walking around, no trees, no grass, no nothing. Um, so that can be pretty nerve wracking after doing that for a long period of time when a person was, was used to going to the school building or, or like the prison I went to, they had this theater program called Rehabilitation Through the Arts. And I found that program quite useful because, you know, for a whole entire year, I had to learn how to perform uh, um, uh, theatrical, put on theatrical events on a stage, how to learn how to block, how to project right. my voice, and I wore costumes, and, right. and 
it made me feel like I was a human being. It made so many others feel like the human being. They learned themselves from, from being in these programs and expressing their emotions and to have that taken away from them at a time like this. And it's like no one to blame. And it's not like the facility is just taken away from us. It's taken away from us in order to keep us safe. But at the same time, it still hurts. You get yeah. fever. You, you even miss some of the civilians that come in that you usually interact with. Right. So, so that can be super tough. So people want to know what it's going to be like when this is all over. Is everyone going to get inoculated? Then we could convene with each other, or right. is there going to be a new way of interact with one another. So, how that you know, is it's it's interesting. It's an interesting thing, I think, that you point out, that they've kind of shut down programming in order to keep people safe. And that, you know, like most of us are staying home or social distancing, or many people are. So it's not that that's not understandable. But if you really do want to keep people safe, aren't you also going to then provide them with soap? I mean, if you can't let people go to class, <laughs> um, it seems like you can make sure they have soap. So it does seem like the opportunities that are being taken from people are the opportunities that provide the most, um, you know, access and resource to people on, on Justice in America, our podcast tomorrow, we're having, um, doing an episode with Rodney Spivy Jones, who's incarcerated currently at Fishkill Correctional Center in, in, in upstate New York. I was there just a few months ago and, you know, Bard Prison Initiative, their programming is in, in Fishkill and, um, you know, this is a life-changing, like you are expressing, just life-changing opportunities for people who are kind of don't have access to opportunities so often. So uh, while I agree, I mean, and obviously you have so much personal experience with this, while I agree that these programs um, taking away the ability for people to get more sick is good, I feel like they should be doing more, <laughs> providing some hand sanitizer if you're not going to let me do the you know, the, the performing arts program. Um, feels like those two things could go hand in hand. Absolutely, definitely. Yeah. And by the way, Rod, I know Rodney, he's an amazing guy. He's so great. Yeah, he's so great. I'm he's really, great. like, the interview was just incredible and he's really great. Um, and so um, the other thing I think that people might wonder about that's sort of related to this about programming is also visitation, right? We're seeing visitation shut down entirely right now. Um, in places where there are alternatives, it's often very, very pricey. Video calling, my brother um, was incarcerated and when he was, when we had to use Secure to, to video, use video calls, that's, I mean, $30, $30 every 10 minutes or something, I mean, really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, phone calls are expensive. Any sort of communication that's not face to face, and even face to face is expensive because it takes you resources to get there, and it takes you know. But like directly, money out of your pocket is um, the visitation options. Could you talk a little bit about what uh, visitation looks like right now? I mean, well, visitation is not existent right well, now. They right. were already uh, scarce to begin with. With mm -hmm. with people usually when people get incarcerated, they get sent furthest away in the state, away from their family. And that would make it harder for the family to travel to visit. And so they're like in prison, just like out here, there's the haves and there's the have nots. The people who are the have got visits and right. they begin to rely on it. And those are the people who are incarcerated who usually thrive the most. They have it together. They don't get in a lot of programs. They're more apt to go to college, you know, they, 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 they feel like they're almost whole. They're not whole all the way, but they feel their mental health is pretty stable. And to take that away from them, and, you know, and once again, it's for a good reason to keep people safe, you know, but still it has that impact on, on the psyche that's, that's kind of hurtful to people. And I really, I thought about that as I prepared my next issue of uh, our next issue, the Marshall Project of the News Inside, because in there is a story that um, the title is a, a family who cracks together, stays together. Mm -hmm. And then one woman, you know, her husband was incarcerated and it would do things like uh, eight o'clock. There's a program on TV. I'm going to watch it at eight and you're going to watch it at eight. Then we're mm -hmm. going to write each other about it. So we're watching it at the same time. We feel like 
were together. And it would do cool things like during Christmas time, she would take a photograph of the ornament on a Christmas tree and mail it to him. And he would put it up on his wall on a Christmas tree that he drew. So they feel like they're connected. So wow. I'm hoping to inspire incarcerated people to do some of those similar things to kind I of stay that. connected. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things we were talking about with Rodney, because Fish Kill is being hit really hard by the virus right now. And when people reached out to him and said, how are you doing? His main concern is his family, right? That's how all of us feel. Our main concern is our family and friends. I think if, if you're healthy, you're, you're not without worry. Um, you know, and when you're more at risk and you can't see the people um, in any way, shape or form that, you know, help that you want to protect, I think it just exacerbates so much of the pain and, and, and tragedy of the situation. Yes. I love, I love that. I love that. I can't wait to watch that. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> the, the other um, question we got that I think is really, um, really important is what does it look like after the virus? Do we think that visitation will go back to normal? Do we think programming will go back to normal? Do we think SOAP will finally have be something people can normally access? Or do we think that the powers that be will take advantage of the limit this the limitations and kind of you know put them in place more permanently dang oh, um. i know it's very it's very depressing to think about yeah it's very depressing and i just know that there's someone that's going to try to take advantage of it and try to limit um some of these interactions with, with, with people but at the same time i know there are people who are incarcerated who are who, who they see the things that have worked with this or what it needs, how important it is to have soap and in writing proposals in order to pitch it to prison administrators to get things changed for the better. And I'm hoping some of those things that, that change for the better actually uh, occur. And, um, and I also hope that, you know, there's some programs that are run by some amazing people. I mentioned RTA, there's also Hudson Lane. There's many programs all over the country and these people who run the programs, they have a long-standing relationship with the prison system. And I hope that uh, um, prison officials don't lock them out because of this. And, but a lot of it is gonna be dependent on our, um, the healthcare community out here. Will, will we find a, a cure or some type of inoculation in order to keep people safe? So mm -hmm. it's gonna depend on that. One, um question we got was about people leaving. Since they're sort of a high percentage of asymptomatic carriers, are people who are leaving correctional facilities being tested? Um, or are there any precautions to make sure that they're not taking this back to their families? Well, I mean, it, it varies by state and it varies by facility. There's right. some that aren't, but I've heard of one facility where a person is leaving and he's being tested when he's left, when he's leaves. And, but oh, also is, um, making sure that he has to stay quarantined for 14 days in the home that he goes to. Interesting. So, and so Sandy Mullins asked that question and I just wanted to say that I, that's really good to hear. I hadn't even heard that. Most of what I'm hearing is that there's no, I think in Ohio they've tested um, almost everybody for the virus in at least a couple of the state facilities, but in general, no, there, there aren't those precautionary measures. And I think this sort of goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, right? Like we talk about wanting to keep people safe, but there are some ways that we could, you know, if you're in a facility where more than half of people have been at least severely exposed to this virus without any cleaning materials, without a face mask, without gloves, um, if you really want to keep people safe, you test them before they, they leave that facility. And we're not seeing that enough places. Yeah. And that's what we need to see. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I wonder as we're sort of wrapping up here, if you want to um, talk about what this means more broadly for criminal justice reform and what where are the places where we need to sort of take what we're seeing in this moment of, of, of illness and apply it to the rest of um, the criminal justice system in terms of what are the changes we want to see and what does this sort of say about our criminal justice system in America? Uh, well, first thing, if 
if it, it comes to that, a lot of people are going to be released because of COVID-19. And if you find, we find that crime doesn't spike, like I mentioned before, then that might be something that, you know, we need to consider as a country, uh, like we're locking people up and, and maybe they don't need to be there because they're not a danger to society as we have thought. I mean, sure, they're going to be outliers. There's going to be some things that happen. It's not going to be a hundred percent, but you know, you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right. that sort of thing. Right. But also, um, we need to think about how prisons are structured. You mm -hmm. know, the inability to social distance when something like this happens. So the way facilities are structured probably should gonna probably is gonna have to change in the future in order to keep everyone everyone safe so those are some of the things that we we need to take a look at and i hope that people will take a look at and you know we'll see what happens yeah you know i think what we what we think about when we think about how this virus kind of um makes clear makes plain who i think as you put it earlier the haves and have nots more broadly right like we know who the essential workers are we know who the people who are mostly getting sick are we know what it means when you actually can't stay home you can't self-isolate we know that poor people people without health care people of color you know these are the people who are being ravaged by this virus i think something came out um today that said half of new yorkers know someone who has died from COVID-19, know of someone who has died from COVID-19. And it 74% of white people do not know anybody who's who's died of COVID-19, right? Wow. But over 50% of black and Latino people do know someone who has died of COVID-19. You know, it's hitting um, outer boroughs much harder than it's hitting Manhattan. It's hitting poor zip codes much harder than it's hitting rich zip codes. And we're seeing, um, you know, all of those social functions are exist and then times 10 when you talk about correctional facilities. I mean, this is where the worst parts of American society are just on display constantly, unapologetically. Um, and it's, it is, I hope, an opportunity, the, if there is an opportunity in this, it's to really rethink what it means to lock someone up. Do you, are you okay with sentencing someone to death? Because that is what you're doing by put, keeping them in prison right now. Um, in Atlanta, where I am, just yesterday, a judge said, well, you know, there are 100 and 200 people, I think, in the local jail here and a judge who have been off, who have been granted bond, but they can't afford bond. And the judge said, they're not letting them out, which means you stay in jail. You probably get coronavirus because coronavirus is already hitting the jail because you're poor. Just because you're poor. That's it. Um, and what, what are we okay being that kind of society? Is that who we want to be? That's a good question. I mean, and, um, I think you, I think you made a, a very valid point. This is putting our culture or our country, the worst parts of our country on display for all the reasons you just mentioned, you know, and and I wonder if people are going to stand up and do something positive about it or people are going to use it in order to get worse. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lawrence, for joining us. Thank Again, you. this is Lawrence Bartley. He's the director of News Inside with the Marshall Project. I'm Josie Duffy Rice. I am president of The Appeal and uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt fellow at New America. Thank you all so much for joining us. And um, Tune in every uh, Tuesday and Thursday for more future tense social distancing, dense, social distancing socials. <laughs> uh, thank every, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>